Welcome to Cartoonist Cafe. My name is Jim Rugg. I'm Ed Piscor. Fun one today, Ed. Steve Ditko. Steve Ditko is Spider-Man and Doctor Strange. Damn near two years of Cartoonist Cafe videos, man. Our first Steve Ditko. We had to amend. We had to amend that. It, it has been too long. Uh, before we dive into this classic comic, what's new? Let's talk about some repugnant shit. <laughs> Specifically, uh, Red Room. Patreon.com slash Ed is where I'm serializing my Red Room comics, uh, horror comics for the new millennium. Uh, three bucks to get you the archive. Issue one is completely up there right at this minute. Go through this one because the, the, the printing is just kind of tighter. Um, the pages are up there at a high enough resolution that you could print them off, make your own bootlegs. Um, it's for the early adopter. There will be a print version in 2021. But every Tuesday, new strips go live and we're... Starting issue two right now. My latest comic book, Octobriana 1976, world's first blacklight comic starring the Russian underground superhero Octobriana, is in stores and online everywhere you get comics. If you want a print edition, I recommend picking it up sooner rather than later because it has been well received and yeah. is selling well. Uh, you can find it online at Comixology or at my site, jimrug.com, along with a 350-page PDF process zine that has all the drafts, has scans of original art, all that good stuff. So this is a story from Amazing Spider-Man Annual Number 2. Uh, one of the things that I thought was super dope was that Steve Ditko actually draws that too. So he's not just drawing 22 pages a month in a year. Like He's also drawing the annual, which is atypical for comics during our lifetime he's also drawing a bunch of dr strange comics it's true so uh yeah the guy's keeping busy and penciling and inking uh both he's the artist man he's not going to put up with any bs and one of the inspirations for for this is uh you know brendan mccarthy brought it up in his conversation with us uh as you know this was an influential piece and he goes on and does a dr strange uh spider-man comic so it was fun to, to dust off I had it in uh, this format, you know, the essential format. It's in Essential Spider-Man number two, and I've actually never seen it in color, so I'm kind of like looking forward, even though this is, you know, a reprint right. with different seps. And I think there's probably one or two other reprints of this story. Pretty iconic. The Ditko stuff gets reprinted every way Marvel can imagine, so you can probably track this story down in several formats. Uh, this is the Marvel Tales version, so pretty good, as close as I'm probably ever going to get to the actual original. Right. yeah. But... Let's dive in, man. Yeah, let's do it. Um, and one one of the noteworthy things, like like reading the comic, was that you could just go through it. Um, Love the lighting to start with. You know, me too. Because I think Ditko is a pretty big influence on Frank Miller, and we're going to see it with some of these panels inside. But I mean, it starts in a way with this kind of dramatic double lighting. You know, For sure. the Ditko Spider Man a lot darker than Spider Man would would be as John Romita Jr. comes on and Gil Kane and those guys. They kind of uh, they brighten up Spider-Man in, in certain ways. Maybe maybe Stan Lee's uh, direction. That original Spider-Man stuff is kind of dark that, it, that Ditko's doing. It is, man. And uh, when McCarthy brought this up, I, you know, I couldn't wait to, to read it. Um, but it's it's pretty much by the numbers. But it got me thinking that you know, there's we we develop our favorite comics sometimes by by uh time and place and where we were and he's over you know he's across the pond so everything isn't being reprinted over there and everything isn't reaching those shores so when there's a spider-man and doctor strange like i can see that being attractive um but it's a it's pretty simple it is very simple we're probably going to enjoy more of the Ditko art than anything else as we flip through this starting with this panel this is frank miller yeah this panel, I, 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 my notes were, how many times do you think Frank Miller copied this panel as a little kid? Right. Because it is a guy in an overcoat in the shadows, you know, the, the, that kind of heavy inking and, and very dark shadowy figures. This is Miller through and through and through. Absolutely. Depending on the day, I read these Silver Age Marvel comics in, in one of two ways. Um, if I'm, if I feel annoyed and I just don't want to hear, you know, Stan Lee's voice. I'll just fuck with it visually. I, d I did that with this. Like, yeah. I read it, and then I went back through and just kind of read it for the images. Called the cauliflower ears of the, of the, uh, of the, you know, this, the, the heavy uh, in a Steve Ditko drawing. It's great uh, physiognomy, I believe they would call it. This guy feels like a mysterious stranger 
traveler kind of guy, almost somebody out of the Charlton Steve Ditko, you know, catalog. For sure. I remember seeing him in some uh, some Doctor Strange reprints I had, and I had no idea that he was a bad guy. And so he is kind of a Doctor Strange, you know, the, the villain is... Like a rival sorcerer or right, something. Right, and he's hypnotized these guys to do his bidding to go get some of uh, some artifact from Doctor Strange. Yeah, the second half to that wand up there in the uh, first panel. One of the things, of course, Ditko lovers cite is all of the Doctor Strange, kind of the mystical stuff, and how he would draw and represent that. And so you see it as soon as we get to Ditko's apartment, I think you start to see that in the patterns on the walls. It's these shapes and lines that were very unusual, you know, you wouldn't find in other comics at the time. So that made it, you know, that that was the visual representation of this mystical master of all these mystical realms. I'm a big fan of the way he, he builds his characters. And uh, once again, the the essential was the only way that I that I read this, um, and so I'm looking at it in black and white. And one of the things that I liked about it was, uh, it's very um, it's very good storytelling visually. And you know the the figure like he he gets it right you know like seven out of ten times. Uh, so you don't have to you know be a virtuoso when it comes to drawing you know human anatomy or whatever. We've said it a million times on this on this show. It's um, those mistakes are the life. Mm-hmm. And one thing you that I noticed when I started really looking at comics is the difference between Ditko and Kirby, mm-hmm. where Ditko's movement is much more left and right, right. and up and down with, without that like coming at you that Kirby brings to it, right. which is fine. No problem. It does create a very dynamic page because of that, and you see it with all the figures. And it's fun to see him doing Spider-Man and the way he kind of distorts Spider-Man's figure because it's still very figure uh, realistic compared to, say, what Todd McFarlane would do decades later. Yeah. But it's also very distorted at times, especially some of the action stuff and swinging around the the city and climbing up buildings. So it's kind of neat to see how he approaches spider-like qualities without going uh, cartoonish on the figure or overly cartoonish. It's it's really fun, like, reading these these comics visually, knowing that, you know, Stan Lee said, you know, three sentences, and, and now it's, like, time for you to to uh, tell the story because... Y- if you're if you're given three sentences and it's time for you to draw a twenty page story, are you going to draw one boring thing? You know what That's I a mean. Good point. And and Ditko, like every panel, like it's totally moving and it's all stakes. It's all there's always some like piece of drama, some action, some cool thing on every page. There's no there's no talking head bullshit. These hands are one hundred percent Frank Miller Daredevil hands. Yeah. There's a lot of drawing that I think Miller comes right back to like th- this Ditko era. So starting to get into some of the mystical stuff now, you know, this villain's got his his uh, wand, his magical tool, and he can open up these different dimensions. He can see in different areas. And this is a lot of what, what I think the Ditko Doctor Strange is known for. Yeah. It's like, let's start getting into the bizarre parts. I love the, uh, I love the gesture right. of this figure so much. And this stuff right here is like some of my favorite stuff of the issue. Yeah, he's getting rid of Spider-Man who followed those goons back to his lair by throwing him in this other dimension. And on his way out, Spider-Web's that that magical device. Yeah, the hands are another part that usually it's Doctor Strange throwing up the weird hand gestures. But if you're battling another uh, wizard, what's good for the goose? (laughs) And this is it. That's the wild stuff, man. But it's, it's, you know, it's... This is a guy who did not take the brown acid at Woodstock trying to come up with some psychedelic, uh, you know, oddball stuff. And it's it's very, um, you know, it's very uh, restrained. You know, it's it's shapes. It's, you know, it's interesting, but... It's also these figures, though, coming in and out. Right. You know, like the, the floated, the floating figures, a leg is sticking out. That stuff's pretty wild. I'm just saying, man, for the for the good of comics, like somebody back then should have made him a part of MK Ultra or something, <laughs> and, and then let's see what those those Doctor Strange comics look like. It's still pretty inventive. Like the dipping through multiple dimensions is fun. Seeing both sides of it. Yeah, the color the color really helps too. Like I love the candy bowl of color in in those uh, in the weird dimensions. And now Doctor Strange is getting involved. That's pretty nice coloring. I like that purple for the night sky with the blue figures. I'm happy with the color on this whole thing. Um, I'm, I'm guessing that this is like earlier in the 80s. Then like the Marvel tales that come later, they use that flexographic uh, color seps and the dots are too far apart and it's just real ugly. 
Yeah, I wonder if they use the original film. You know, like companies used to store that. They so. did. There it is, Bob Bell, the creator of the uh, of the poly bag. Smartest man in comics history. Ditko peeking through the the astral form of uh, Strange yeah, peeking through the wall. When he's that little ghost guy, <laughs> it um it makes me think of those Lev Gleason cri crime crime must pay or whatever right. uh, where yeah, there's, the that, there's that little ghost dude that's like floating around this is pretty neat to see Doctor Strange as a black and white drawing in a color comic yeah he's getting the most out of these effects if you think of this coming out in the 60s like how far could you push it you right. know if you were really some burnout acid head that could draw this stuff it's underground comics you know it's, it's not like that was something Marvel would have been ready to publish so this is taking advantage of probably as much as you could do. Like, what can you invent? Well, let's do some black and white art in a color book. Yeah, and, and also just like what we know about Steve Ditko, kind of, kind of like a hermit, kind of like insular. So, he, so you know, he, what's he looking at? You know, like he's got to just, he's just come. The cool thing is, this is all coming out of his head. So this is like, this is his language. This is as far as he goes. He's not hanging out with hippies. In fact, it's probably the hippies that made him want to stay inside the crib because I. I can feel that vibe. It's probably very true. Also worth noting, this is aimed at like seven-year-olds. It is. It's, this it's is kids long comics. before comics were being done by Marvel for older readers. And I think whenever Marvel does start doing that, like when you see Dicko stuff at Marvel was saying in the 80s, it has that kid vibe. Mm -hmm. You know, like he wasn't making those comics. He wasn't trying to do a Frank Miller comic for, you know, 14-year-olds or something. And... It works really well at this stage. Like this is what this is aimed at. This could have been a cartoon episode. I uh, some of my earliest, my very earliest comics were Marvel Tales. Um, you know, from from actually, I guess around this period, to be honest, maybe a little bit earlier. It was the one where uh, it's J. Jonah Jameson with his face on the TV on on that like monster, like uh, that robot kind of ensnaring uh, Spider Man. That was one of my first comics. And I was a huge mark for Stan Lee, like his, the Silver Age stuff, because they, you know, they're one and done, they're a complete story, and the comics that I'm getting off the rack is part two of, you know, Craven's Last Hunt and crap like, so it's like a complete story, it feels very satisfying, Glenn Danzig owes, owns, uh, he, or at least for a time, he was on that Felix comic art, uh, uh, YouTube channel, and he owns s several um, splash pages from this annual. Wow. That would be an amazing thing to, to own. So, not a big story. You know, it's, it's relatively slight, but you do get to see the two Marvel characters that, that Ditko's most closely associated with. You get to see them both doing a little bit of their thing. Pretty good template for how a team, a team up of super characters in a shared universe would go at this time. Good comics, man. You yeah. know, you can see why he's influential and why why people continue to look at him and to and to and to take from him. Always the uh, the hands, you know, he's so uh, expressive, like in a psychological point of view. And I always think of his hands. Like there's always, I don't know, some form of expression going on there, and it's something I never think of because hands are notoriously hard to draw. But having that kind of twisted up, you know, constant in motion. Something I associate with Ditko. Well said. So, any other thoughts, Ed, before we wrap up this first venture into uh, looking at Steve Ditko? I'm sure it won't be the last time we, we take apart one of his comics and, and think about it. Yeah, it can't be, can't be the last. Uh, I, I enjoyed it. I'm glad uh, Brendan like, has sort of inspired us to dust off some of uh, the Silver Age stuff. And uh, there will definitely be more. You know, Spider-Man has gone on to be... Marvel's Batman in terms of artists coming in and they get to do McFarlane's version of Spider-Man and, you know, fill in the blank, whoever's drawing him, you get to kind of interpret that character. He's flexible. Doctor Strange has always been the Ditko Doctor Strange. That's true. Even whenever guys like a Michael Golden or, or Marshall Rogers or somebody comes up and really, you know, a, a, a well-known stylist, they still, it's it's the Ditko Doctor Strange. Yeah, that's, that's true. And And I don't think to this day, I don't think that they cracked the code on how to on how to make the greatest Doctor Strange comic like like I know what you have to do but but it has to be mo like a manga almost yeah I think I think you're probably right he's such an atypical character for Marvel there's a really good I think it's in the comics journal interview with Eddie Campbell where Campbell talks about 
Steve Ditko's Doctor Strange art. And it's pretty fantastic as he describes some of what he sees in it. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I would encourage anybody that's a big Ditko fan to seek that out. Eddie Campbell's so good about talking about comics, art, and really breaking it down and seeing it through the perspective of an, of an artist, but also highlighting what makes it work or makes it unique. And his appreciation of Steve Ditko, it's a great read for anybody that's a fan of comics art. Where would we find that? It's in the Eddie Campbell uh, interview in the Comics Journal. I think it's the From Hell uh, issue of the comics journal. Dave. I think there's a big interview with him and he, and he talks about it and really like, it's great because he talks about it as if he was reading it as a kid and what he was seeing, which was art that didn't look like any other comics, you know, like these realms that were, you know, saying, Hey, he didn't do acid, you know, right. uh, that may be true, but for somebody reading these comics when they were coming out, it looked like nothing else. Yeah. And especially if you were like, I love Marvel comics. And then there's this just super weird visuals really uh worth checking out and you might be able to find it online i wouldn't be surprised super cool get out yep all right k favors like follow subscribe to the youtube channel hit the bell we'll notify you when new vids are available octobrian is in stores now and also available on comiXology patreon.com slash ed is where i'm serializing red room first issues up there now three bucks get you the archive new strips every tuesday you can subscribe to the Cartoonist Kayfabe e-newsletter at the links below this video. You can also find our social media accounts at the links below this video where we often post the stuff that we are looking at and thinking about for the show, but lots of comics in these boxes, so we don't get to everything on the show. Um, you can find Cartoonist Kayfabe t-shirts and merchandise at the links below the video as well. Give them those merchandise, Jimmy. Read more comics.